Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Resolution Foundation webinar. Today we're talking about low pay, and particularly what a new settlement for the low paid should look like as we come out of this crisis. Now, this is a bit of different to um, Resolution Foundation webinars that we've had over the course of this crisis so far. So far, we've mainly been focusing on making sure that we're helping to describe what is happening during this crisis, including that it's lower earners who are bearing the brunt of the crisis. And then we've been helping to describe and to prescribe what we think the policy response should be in the depths of this crisis, be that on the job retention scheme or on universal credit or on any other area. So this is a bit different today. Today, we're looking further ahead and saying, coming out of this crisis, what should the future look like? How should we be aiming to be coming out with a different kind of economy and specifically a different kind of labor market to the one uh, that we went in with. Now, this event is uh, marking the launch of a paper setting out a detailed plan for what we think the new settlement uh, for the low page should look like, covering a host of areas. And that's what we're going to talk about over the course of this um, session today. Obviously, lying behind all of this is the fact that there are 4.2 million low paid workers in the country and that those have disproportionately borne both the health effects of this crisis, but also its economic effects uh, to date. We see that in data on um, who can't work from home, but also on who has lost their jobs so far in this crisis. So that is the backdrop. To let us do that, we're first of all going to hear from Hannah Slaughter, who's one of the authors of the report at the foundation today, taking you through a summary of the headlines for that. And then I'm very glad to say we're going to hear from Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC, who has obviously been busy over decades talking about low pay, as well as busy over the last few months talking about uh, what the government's response during this crisis uh, should be. And that's been in um, uh, that's been central to a lot of the work we've seen on the job retention scheme and other areas. And then we're going to hear from Sarah Brown, who is an, uh, a professor at the University of Sheffield and also a member of the Low Pay Commission. And in doing that, she's been involved for years as well in helping to set the wages of the lowest earners in our society. So everyone has spent a lot of time on this topic. That is hopefully a good thing because that provides a backdrop to how we think about how the world should change in future. Now, as always from these seminars, you can engage on Slido. You can ask questions there, support other people's questions or engage in the polls. Uh, I think the hashtag this time is hashtag from claps to cash, it's a catchy title. Uh, there's already one poll up there, which is what we're going to show you now for you to give us your views about, which is you know, low, low paid work has been in the news as this crisis has gone on because the distributional impact of the health and economic risk has been so bottom heavy. But what do you think has been the effect of that really in terms of changing attitude to low paid work and workers? Because that is obviously affects the political backdrop and the substantive backdrop to what we're going to come on to talk about. So you can vote on that while we hear from our uh, speakers over the course of the next five minutes. So. That is enough from uh, me to kick us off. Hannah is going to share some slides, hopefully using the wonders of 21st century technology that has about a 50% chance of success. There we go, 100% success. Right, Hannah, over to you. Thanks, Torsten. Um, yeah, so as Torsten um, mentioned at the beginning, um, we've got a new report out today looking at what a new settlement should look like for low paid workers that is based on dignity and respect um, that we should be thinking about as we start to rebuild from this crisis. Um, so we know that low paid workers have got a lot of well-deserved recognition over the past few months. Um, we know it's, it's low paid workers like carers, cleaners, supermarket workers who are helping to keep the country going. But also low paid workers are more likely to be bearing the economic brunt of the crisis. So this chart shows um, that, for example, the lowest paid earners are um, three times as likely to have lost their job or been furloughed as the highest paid workers. So it's really important that we start thinking about um, how to support them going forward to match the gratitude that we've shown for the key workers and, and the recognition of the unequal impacts of the crisis with some policy action. Um, so what should a new settlement for the low paid look like? Well, firstly, by increasing pay for the lowest earners. So over the past few years, the national living wage has been really successful in helping to drive down 
um, low pay. So that blue line has been going down. It's now, um, we've now got only 15% of workers below um, two thirds of median earnings, which is what is our benchmark. So that's the lowest level in four decades. And we also haven't seen increases in the number of people paid um, at the wage floor either. So this green line at the bottom hasn't been going up. So people who are a bit um, further up the wage distribution have been getting pay rises too. Um, so we really welcome the government's commitment to abolish low pay by the middle of this decade um, through increases in the minimum wage and we are recommending that um, the government maintain that commitment subject to um, advice from the low pay commission um, and what is going on in the wider economy. But pay isn't everything and low paid workers often have poor working conditions as well. So one thing that's really important is working hours. So the hours themselves are important and we know that um, low paid workers work fewer hours than higher earners and they're also more likely to want to increase their hours and, and obviously that would help them um, increase their pay as well. But they also have much higher anxiety about last minute changes to their working hours. So this chart shows that workers in the lowest paid occupations like sales and customer service, for example, um, up to two fifths of those workers are anxious about last minute changes and um, to their hours of work. And that, um, that often means that they lose pay as well if, if their shift is cancelled at the last minute. Um, so we are recommending more security for workers um, and more control over the hours that they work. Um, so that could be, for example, in giving people the right to a fixed hours contract if the flexibility of a zero hours contract isn't working in their favour. Um, and for employers to give workers advance notice of the shifts that they're going to be working and um, with workers entitled to compensation for last minute changes, um, along with a right to request more hours for part time workers who would prefer um, to work full time. And how often you get paid matters too. And there's not been very much attention on this so far, but over the past two decades, there's been a big move to paying workers less often. Um, so especially for low paid workers, they're much less likely to get paid month, um, weekly now than they were two decades ago. So much more um, employees now are being paid only every month in arrears. Um, and cash flow is really important for family finances. So it, it would be really good to get people um, the right to choose how often they're paid, um, which is what we're recommending. So for large firms, that can be um, for individuals to choose. Um, large firms are more likely to be able to cope with putting bespoke arrangements in place for workers. But even for smaller firms, there should be um, consultation over payroll regularity and make sure that workers' views get fed into those decisions. More widely, there's a role for labour market rules. Um, so at the moment, um, low earners just don't get a lot of the um, protections that higher earners take for granted. So in the early days of the crisis, there was a lot of focus on sick pay and how um, the lowest earners just aren't entitled to it at all. But there are other areas where low earners are disadvantaged. So this chart is showing um, that low earners are less likely to have been in their jobs for two years. Um, which is the threshold for being eligible for protection against unfair dismissal. And so we are recommending um, that sick pay is extended to lower earners and to reduce the requirements to qualify for protection against unfair dismissal so that workers can um, pursue a case after they've been in a post for one year instead of two years. But labour market rules are no use if they're not enforced. Um, and we know that violations of workers' rights are already far too common. So this chart shows that almost, that actually just over a fifth of minimum wage workers are paid below the legal minimum. And part of that is just because the fines are just not high enough to act as an incentive to businesses to comply. Um, and another area that hasn't had much of a look in until very, very, very recently is health and safety. Um, and the structures to enforce that are, are very weak. Um, there's not, there's, there have been cuts to funding and particularly to local government who enforce a lot of the kind of, what would in normal times be lower risk environments, but are now um, obviously in a world of social distancing can be very high risk. So we are recommending that um, enforcement bodies are properly resourced. So we really welcome the government's um, decision to introduce a single enforcement body to consolidate um, the capacity against most of the organisations that um, uphold workers' rights. Um, and there should, uh, that um, resourcing should be extended, of course, to um, the local authorities as well for health and safety. Um, and fines for non-compliance need to be higher to offer genuine protection to workers. 
And finally, worker power is really important, not just for negotiating pay, but also for negotiating wider standards and training. Um, so we can see from this chart that it's the lowest paid workers who are least likely to be union members. And although there's been some hope in the latest data that's shown that, for example, young workers today are more likely to be union members than previous generations. And there has been a slight increase in unionization in the past couple of years collective bargaining could still play a bigger role in helping to um, support workers, particularly the low paid. Um, so we're recommending that unions should be given um, the right to enter workplaces and raise awareness among workers. And for those sectors where standards need to be um, raised most urgently, so particularly, um, for example, social care, we're proposing 21st century wage boards. So they would bring together workers, employers and independent representatives to collectively agree paying conditions um, and help support um, working um, worker standards. So here's just a quick summary of um, all the rec uh, recommendations I've just talked through. So higher pay, but matched with control over working hours, control of when you're paid um, and more rights that are effectively enforced alongside an institutional framework to give workers a voice. And it's worth saying that all these proposed changes are, are achievable. They're not massively radical, but all of them would improve the lives of our 4.2 million low paid workers. And together they'd give low paid workers the better working conditions that they deserve as we think about um, how we want to move forward in our post pandemic economy. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Hannah, that's a, a good impressively not going through every recommendation of the report. So there's hopefully some audience left out there but also showing that the general argument here which is we have over you look back over that you know, we talked a lot about good work in the last decade if we're honest with ourselves the progress we made was basically just on the minimum wage and hourly pay is really important but having work that has within it respect control dignity about who takes what decisions about people's work and about the control people have is, is as important and we haven't done well enough on that and this is a what we think is a pretty this, this, is a, uh, this is a moderate package. This is not what everybody would always want who's on the workers' rights side of things, but it could definitely be done. And that is why we think it's um, the right way forward. So, Francis, over to uh, you to give us your view. Thanks very much, uh, Torsten. And thanks to Hannah and the team, because I think it is a really important report. And um, certainly I welcome uh, the recommendations. I think my biggest hope for seeing that report implemented in terms of the public policy is the real shift in public mood. Um, I think if we're honest that the pandemic has opened all of our eyes to that question of the true value of labour and why it is that the value of people's labour isn't recognised. Uh, I think we've all heard a lot of uh, politicians talk about low paid work as unskilled work when it's become incredibly clear to us through this pandemic that some of the most important jobs, the most skilled jobs are rewarded least. And I think we also need a pretty sharp eye on the fact that um, they're much more likely to be women are much more likely to be black and ethnic minorities. So, you know, 50 years on from celebrating uh, the introduction of the Equal Pay Act, we know that we've got over two and a half million key workers who are women who are on less than £10 an hour. Uh, we've also seen the health impact with um, the uh, somewhat pruned down report uh, published yesterday, but it did tell us that black workers, black and ethnic minority workers are up to twice as likely to die from the virus. And given, um, I know some are very fond of talking about underlying health conditions, we know that many of those health conditions are the symptoms of poverty and inequality uh, rather than the cause. And so there are real structural issues around inequality and discrimination that need tackling. Um, I was also um, somewhat bemused that yesterday uh, we saw that Vogue magazine is putting on its front cover uh, three key workers, a train driver, a midwife um, and a supermarket uh, worker. And I guess, I mean, apart from the obvious point, Torsten, why not you, uh, on adorning the front cover of Vogue, 
um, and I'm sure you know it's a great experience and all of that. Uh, and it could be a reflection of genuine recognition and appreciation, or there will be those who say it's about commodification of low paid dedication to the job. Um, but what it does tell us, I think, is that, you know, certainly corporations are picking up on that widespread public feeling um, that too many people have put their lives on the line for a pittance and it can't go on. So what should happen now? The applause has stopped. I think um, the Resolution Foundation recommendations on security of income are really important, certainly in terms of the national minimum wage and the new wages boards. Um, we shouldn't forget that government is an employer too, and it's also the funder of procurement. So when we know that, you know, the majority of care workers are extremely low paid and often not even getting still the basic PPE that they need. I think we need to um, place some calls on government in terms of stepping up to its responsibilities. Um, security of hours is, in our experience at the TUC, absolutely critical. You cannot plan your childcare, you cannot predict your earnings, you cannot plan your life unless you've got a degree of security around hours. And we know that the impact that zero hours and sham employment have had. Um, again, disproportionately affecting um, women and young people, but also, you know, we were talking to um, one of the groups we spoke to, uh, a group of new dads, very often doing um, work in logistics, delivery drivers, warehouse workers, who were really expressing kind of real distress at the fact that they couldn't play the part in their kids' lives that they wanted to because they never knew uh, whether they could be there with them because they didn't know from one week to the next when their shifts would be. And then critically, of course, dignity and voice at work and uh, work is right to speak to their own union in their workplace would make a huge difference, I think, to uh, giving people that collective voice and collective enforcement of their rights. Um, there are just three quick things I wanted to highlight. I think collective bargaining is really, really important. There is such a clear correlation between the decline in collective bargaining coverage and the rise of inequality. Um, secondly, outsourcing, you know, again, just yesterday, Homerton Hospital um, looks like they're going to award uh, the contract for cleaners to ISS again, yet again, entrenching that two tier workforce um, where, you know, a, a lot of workers feel really strongly that not only are they paid worse um, and have worse conditions, but they're kind of put on the outside of what ought to be a sense of public service, family and community. Um, so that needs to be tackled. And a real urgency on sick pay. Um, if we ever get this um, track and trace scheme up and running, then workers may well be expected to um, remove themselves from work, to isolate themselves um, for two weeks. Uh, and uh, two million workers don't earn enough to even qualify for statutory sick pay. But even if you do, £95 a week to um, bring a family up on is pitiful. And, you know, if we've got to take seriously the public health consequences of the real cuts that we've seen to welfare provision over many years and the impact that has because frankly if you're on low pay it's hard enough but to go on to statutory sick pay many workers just won't be able to afford to do the right thing so I think there is real urgency in tackling that. Um, finally for me uh, I think you know I do have real optimism around that public mood and public push um, for real change in our priorities and how we reward people. But of course, we're all conscious of that Treasury document that was circulating that was reaching for the old orthodoxies uh, of paying down the debt through 
uh, another dose of austerity and cuts, deregulation of workers' rights and tax cuts uh, for the wealthy. So I think we need to broaden this conversation to um, how we really are going to level up Britain and build back better and all those other slogans that we hear in a way that genuinely is around investment and growth and that recognises that the protection and creation of good, decent jobs on fair rewards is central to the answer. Uh, you know, people have got to feel it in their pay packets and they are entitled to respect at work. Um, so as for key workers, we certainly do owe a debt. And I think in respect of key workers, it's time to pay up. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Francis. There's a good mixture of optimism that is <laughs> changing with some uh, some deep pessimism about the actual situation that we uh, find the country in, but it's good to have a mix in life. I'll even forgive you for the Vogue reference. Now, <laughs> uh, maybe. Now, Sarah, you, you, you get to, you've been actually uh, doing things as a policymaker as well as an academic over the last few years. And the Low Pay Commission actually, as well as obviously overseeing the minimum wage itself, has done important work on uh, the regularity of hours and the notice period for hours that we touch on. In fact, the recommendations we make are broadly in line with what the Low Pay Commission and you have called for. So over to you. OK, thanks, Torsten. Well, I'm going to focus on the future and the future of the national living wage, the kind of pay part of the settlement. So just a little bit of a context. Over a year ago, we were marking the 20th anniversary of the UK national minimum wage, and we were discussing the future of the NLW beyond 2020. Now, this has been confirmed. The LPC has been asked to recommend the NLW rate, which should apply from April 2021 in order to reach two thirds of median earnings by 2024. And if we think back to the introduction of the NLW, I think the title of a Financial Times article at that time summarises what many were thinking, world watches Britain's living wage experiment. Now, it certainly seems a long time ago that the LPC was plotting the path from the introduction of the NLW in 2016 at £7.20 to 60% of median earnings by 2020. But the research suggests that the NLW has been a success, it's increased the pay for the lowest paid, and there hasn't been adverse impact on employment. So the evidence suggests that the NLW experiment has been successful. Now, as we know, the final step of the path to 60% of median earnings was taken this April, just, after, just over a week after the national lockdown started, when the NLW increased by 6.2% from £8.21 to £8.72. Now, as discussed by Hannah and Francis, many of the nation's key workers in, for example, the care sector, agriculture, transport and retail are low paid. Many are continuing to work in very challenging and risky conditions, and many will have benefited from the latest NLW increase. But as shown in Hannah's first slide, there are high proportions of low paid workers who have lost hours, been furloughed or indeed lost their jobs. Now, the sexual dimension here is critical. The effects of the lockdown measures vary by sector. And as the lockdown measures are eased, different sectors are able to open up at different stages. So, for example, if we consider hospitality, where there are a lot of low paid workers, many of whom are young, it's not clear when hospitality is going to open up. So in terms of moving forward, um, given this backdrop and thinking about the future of the NLW, I think it's important to acknowledge that the last effects, the, the effects of the last step to 60 percent of median earnings are unknown. And in contrast to other steps which were made at times when the labour market in terms of employment was in good shape, we're now in a very difficult, different, different and uncertain economic climate. There are particular challenges we face going forward in terms of evaluating the effects of the 2020 increases. And these are not just technical issues about data quality and availability, but given the success of the furlough scheme, many firms haven't experienced the new rates yet. So we need to look backwards to ascertain the effects of the 2020 increase. And we also need to look forwards to the future path of the NLW up to 2024. 
Now, the LPC has always been clear that the decision regarding the level of ambition for the NLW is a political decision. We are very pleased that our, that, that our 2020 remit states that the LPC will continue to have a central role. We're going to be making our recommendations to government on the 2021 rates in October, and this will be the first step of the NLW to two thirds of median earnings. Now we set out our thinking about the implications of a more ambitious target in our November and 2019 report. And one of the things we emphasized in the context of successfully achieving a more ambitious target is that the LPC needs flexibility to respond to changes in economic circumstances. So we're very pleased that the government has recognized this in that our remit includes an emergency break. Specifically, we have been asked to monitor the labor market, advise on any emerging risks, and if the economic evidence warrants it, to recommend that the government reviews its target or time frame. Now, the importance of such flexibility is particularly apparent now, but even in the absence of the COVID-19 pandemic, by international standards, we need to recognize that this is an ambitious target. So given the very challenging circumstances faced by workers and employers, we need to carefully evaluate whether the emergency break is needed or not. Um, and as we set out in our April 2020 report, we're going to look at a wide range of economic evidence and indicators, such as the overall output of the economy, the level of employment, particularly in low paying sectors, the growth in earnings and productivity, and what's going to be particularly important is that we continue to gather evidence from our stakeholders. Now, if after looking at all of this evidence, if we do decide that the emergency break is needed, this could take different forms. For example, we could choose to recommend reducing the increase in a given year, but still commit to reaching the two thirds target in 2024. Or we could choose to recommend that the government delay the target year. So if I could just briefly comment on enforcement, um, as Hannah stated, the evidence suggests that since the introduction of the NLW, there has been an increase in non-compliance. Um, just to add a, a couple of extra points here, which I think are, are relevant. For many workers, the margin of underpayment is significant, as detailed in our May 2020 report. For example, approximately 40% of the underpaid NLW workers were paid less than the previous year's rate. In addition, I think it's important to note that there's variation across sectors and the majority of underpaid workers are found in retail, hospitality, cleaning and maintenance. So in the context of moving forward, in the context of a more ambitious NLW target, it's important to continue to monitor the enforcement of workers' rights, but not just in terms of pay, but in all areas. So finally, the NLW clearly has an important part to play in ending low pay and achieving a better settlement for workers. But as is quite clear from the two presentations, it cannot do this by itself. For example, increases in hourly pay do not automatically lead to higher weekly pay, which is what's important for living standards. Obviously, uncertainty over hours of work makes the translation to weekly pay very difficult for individuals. So in this context, we were very pleased to note this morning that three of today's recommendations from the Resolution Foundation, the right to switch to a contract reflecting normal hours, reasonable notice of work schedule and compensation for shift cancellation or containment match the recommendations that the LPC made in December 2018 in our response to one sided flexibility. We also comment in the report on the fact that the potential to lose hours of work can make workers wary of asserting their rights more generally and in the context of holiday and sick pay entitlement, as Francis has just mentioned, this is particularly relevant. But to end on a positive note, employer and employee stakeholders alike have told us that they support the ambition to abolish low pay. So thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. So there's lots of food of thought in there, but two things we'll definitely come back to in particular. One is um, how does the fact that we're now, you know, record employment feels a very long time ago, even though it's only two and a half months ago. So this is a world of high unemployment that we're going to be in for the foreseeable future. How does that affect how we think about um, this kind of new settlement? We'll come back to that. Come back to that, and the uh, and highlighting the enforcement challenge is also really um, 
really key. Now, for the rest of this, um, we've got until we're on another half an hour. So we're going to do two halves of the remainder of this conversation. First of all, we're going to dig into using your questions on Slido, the situation actually facing low paid workers in two broad chunks, one of which is around what's actually happening right now. And then also like what is the like background situation we were wrestling with even when we had high unemployment and a high minimum wage? What were the challenges that were still out there? Some of which Hannah covered in her presentation. And then we'll turn to what the answers are, you know, why some of our ideas are rubbish, uh, why everyone's got some, some better ones. Francis, you can have some better ones. Um, uh, that's the second half of our conversation. Now, but to kick us off, we're first of all going to go back to what Francis said about, we're going to see whether you agree with Francis that public attitudes have moved in a permanent way rather than just in a uh, temporary way or not at all. So these are the questions you've been looking at. The answers are, that's all right. Well, you, you largely, oh, okay, no, you're not very positive. Okay, so, so basically you are coming out heavily on the cynical, everyone's clapped away, but we'll forget about it in um, the next, you know, when the mo world moves on. That is very pessimistic. I hope something good's happening in everyone's days back home to make them more optimistic than that uh, as we go forward. Anyway, so that's, well, that's good. Then we should come back to that when we touch on the future chance for uh, change in the second half of this conversation. So we touch on, on what is going on um, uh, in this slide, what's going on right now? So there's a question on Slido from Sally about what is definitely a really important point, which is that people have very different experiences of this lockdown. So listen, obviously low paid workers are more likely to have lost their jobs, but even if they haven't, people's ability about choice about where they work and level of support is very um, different. And that, you know, you can see that in some people are writing articles in newspapers about, you know, baking and being able to read new books while other people are writing articles about people losing their jobs and that is a very different experience so francis do you want to just pick up that first of all about the distributional nature of what this shock that crisis is doing to people oh, you're just going to be unmuted um i think it's uh you know without doubt it feels as if there are these new classes developing where you've got people who can work from home and are um, asked to continue to work from home, having deliveries at the door from people who have worked through this crisis. Um, you know, and, and I agree that sometimes when I read some of the media comment, you wouldn't know that there have been millions of people who have worked all the way through. Um, but even for those um, who are now currently at home, either because they're working from home or or furloughed, I think there are incredibly different experiences. And, you know, what seems to be clear already is that those on insecure contracts are kind of uh, first in the line to be um, made unemployed um, and lose their job. So we're, we're seeing those kind of new dynamics opening up. Um, I know we're going to get on to this later, but I think, I think we shouldn't kind of regard this as somehow inevitable and i also think that the the public mood um for sure i respect the pessimists out there who think it's temporary but i do think this is different because this pandemic has affected so many of us in a really personal way and i don't think any of us are going to kind of forget about our relatives in care homes and what happened to them or our friends and family who are shielded because they have vulnerabilities. And so if we go out to work, we're terrified of what we might bring back. Um, or, or about you know, the way in which refuse collectors and delivery drivers and care workers and health workers have just, and transport workers have carried on through this. Um, so it feels too personal to be temporary. Okay, that is... Um... That's good. Now, one, one issue that um, Sarah touched on is that the hospitality sector in particular is obviously front and centre. As in, we've, just shut, we've shut down an entire sector. It is the biggest low paying uh, sector in our economy. The, and that's why you're seeing such high unemployment and furlough rates amongst workers from that sector. So there's a question from Kerry, which I'm going to attempt to. Here we go. Um, which brings up one specific question about uh, those workers, which is, the furlough scheme gives you 80% of your previous pay YE, i.e. how much you were being paid through the payroll. It doesn't take into account 
uh, people's tips broadly. It's one way of thinking about it in some sectors. So Sarah, I don't know if you've done any thinking about that, but just more generally on the hospitality sector, like this is where the rubber hits the road on the strength of the lockdown, but also the lasting effect on low paid workers as we even move into the recovery. Yes, in, in, indeed. I mean, this is why I picked out the hospitality sector. And also, I was reading the TUC Better Cover Recovery Report uh, yesterday, and, and, and the report from the TUC kind of highlights a, a number of sectors where the probability of unemployment is, is high, and, and the hospitality is, is, is one of those. And as I said, there are particularly concerns because they, there's a lot of young, pay, uh, young workers employed in hospitality, and we all know that spells of unemployment can have scarring effects Go, in, go going into their future lives and, and, and so on. So yes, no, there, there are there are particular concerns here. Um, and in terms of the importance of tips, yes, I mean that that's that's another point to take into consideration. Uh, when when we start getting together for our deliberations in in October, we're obviously we, we make recommendations for the economy as a whole. But thinking carefully um, about those sectors such as hospitality, where there has been a bit a particular particularly hard effect is going to be um, an important part of our decision making and evidence gathering. Um, and in addition to this, thinking about how uh, hospitality workers overall remuneration packages um, have, have been adversely affected is also something, something important that, that we need to take into consideration. So it's a good point, Kerry. On, um, on enforcement, just briefly, just in terms of the, the, the status quo, so when we look at one of the things I think is an issue being like involved in a labour market dispute is probably less clear to people is that the, the unusual thing about the UK's labour market enforcement system is outside of the minimum wage area. I'm, I'm generalising here because there are other exceptions, but the big one is the minimum wage. But apart from those exceptions, the default position is that it's the job of the worker to enforce their own rights through an employment tribunal case rather than the state agency responsible for that area prosecuting somebody or bringing the case on their behalf and that what one of the effects of that is that if we when we if we line up data showing which workers were most likely to suffer from a labor market abuse or breach of their rights it's obviously lower paid workers most likely to be affected for all the obvious reasons about power in the labor market but then when we look at who brings employment tribunal cases the distribution is the opposite because it's higher earners uh, that it's higher earners that can bring those uh, tribunal cases they involve legal risk they involve legal costs it can take years to work through the system uh, and so unsurprisingly lots of workers decide it's not worth their while so is there i mean is it it's not just to do with it, the nature of the system as much as which body uh, is also important now i don't know uh, uh, hannah you're obviously doing lots of work for us on enforcement more generally at the moment but do you want to just give us like where the which aspects of that we see that coming through yeah, so um, I mean, as you mentioned, there's um, a lot of work that we've done showing kind of the disproportionate impacts of kind of labour market violations on particular groups. So particularly like people in, in low paid industries, particularly retail hospitality, they're kind of always um, big sectors as well as I think um, social care. So um, I'm, I mentioned in my presentation that um, we're really glad that the government's bringing in the single um, enforcement body to consolidate all its resource. And one of the big priorities um, will be to make sure that it's kind of starting from an attitude of actually protecting workers and actually making sure that um, that they're not just letting people take on all the burden and the risk themselves because that's uh, that's naturally going to disadvantage low paid workers and for example younger workers or workers on more insecure um contracts or, or less securely attached to the labor market okay thank you hannah francis just here's a, here's a question about society rather than just about the labor market which is anyone w driving around uh the country knows that hand car washes are a flagrant breach of almost every labour right known to humanity, and yet people are, and yet society has basically accepted that there's a part of our labour market outside of our labour market rules. What is going on? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure whether society does accept that, but I do think that there has been a deliberate pro, uh, policy of weakening regulation, weakening rights, uh, but most importantly, because of course rights aren't worth the paper they're written on unless you can enforce them, weakening those, not just inspectorates, but actually our ability to organise collectively to look after workers, us looking after ourselves, 
and we know that the best way to do that is through unions. Um, but we have seen that, and again, I think the virus has exposed that we now have fewer health and safety inspectors. We have a uh, on site than we had 10 years ago. Uh, the budget's been cut to shreds for local authorities who often have responsibility for warehouses, for example, where we know people are still being crammed in, not socially distanced and not working safely. Um, we've, we've seen that across a whole range of areas. Uh, and of course, we also saw this government introduce employment tribunal fees, and they were only scrapped after Unison, uh, when, when our biggest trade union affiliate, uh, took the government to the highest court in the land to get them scrapped. And we still haven't got a guarantee that they won't try and reintroduce them in a in a kind of new form. So again, I think this is a is a massive area for us, um, and we've got to um, surface it, but also put in place the real practical changes and resources uh, that would deal with it. Now, j just one quick point is that usually in our experience, what you find is that if you have an employer who's offending on, say, health and safety, they're very likely to be offending on uh, the minimum wage, agency workers' rights, a whole range of other areas. So you get multiple repeat offenders, if you like. Um, and so a joined up approach in terms of our enforcement bodies is really important. But my only caution is that when you look back on, for example, the merging of equality commissions, it turned out that that was really about cutting resources and um, uh, reducing their status and uh, ability to have an impact. So um, I think we have to watch with a really sharp eye how this single enforcement body turns out, because if, it, if it's about, uh, for example, reducing the uh, quite significant powers that health and safety inspectors have to the lowest common denominator, that wouldn't be doing any of us any favours. Okay, just before the last bit where we're just focusing on the kind of situation before we get to the hard bit, which is easier to describe than get onto what the answers are. But on the on the situation, just to make sure it's worth just like, if we look back at the last decade, having the, we're obviously because we're focused on improving things, focusing on the negative sides of the situation. I think we should, is the flip side of that, so if the government was um, here, and obviously we invite government ministers to all of our uh, webinars, but if they were here, they would be pointing to, if you look at the earnings distribution of earnings rises over the last decade, it's obviously very bottom heavy. Like you much higher pay rises for the bottom third of the workforce than the rest of the uh, workforce. Now, basically bugger all work pay rises for the middle over the whole decade, because that's the living standards crisis we've been through. But the bottom has definitely seen much higher, 6% rise last year. And they would also point to uh, record employment levels. And in terms of where that growth has been, it's the growth in the employment has been amongst workers who tend to be in lower paying roles. It's not that the growth in jobs has all been lower paid because some people in the middle have moved up. Uh, but, if we, but the kind of groups that have come in are disproportionately in high unemployment areas amongst some of our ethnic minority uh, groups, those with lower skills in particular. So, Sarah, why don't you, you know, let's, let's, let's have a little bit of a focus on the, what's the stuff that's gone well at the, the bottom end over the last decade? <laughs> trying to have a bit of optimism. Yeah, I, like some optimism. I, I think the Low Pay Commission has done a great job in, in, in steering <laughs> um, the, the, the wages at the, at the bottom of the, the, the pay distribution forward. Um, I think it, it's clear, um, as Hannah talked about in terms of coverage, what, what a, a, a positive sign are the positive wage spillovers in the sense that we haven't just seen uh, NLW and minimum wage workers benefiting from our increases. Um, pay has gone up again a, a little bit higher up the wage distribution which has got to be a positive thing um, so we know from what we were talking about earlier in terms of the employment figures I mean up until very recent times the employment figures were looking in good shape in terms of uh, groups in society that tend to have relatively low levels in, of employment they were looking positive and, and, and so on so I think there are lots of things that have gone well but obviously when we think more holistically about the idea of uh, good work and good jobs there's still a lot more that need, needs to be done so for example Torsten you were talking um, about skills earlier I mean one of the things when 
um, we will embark on our regional visits. They're suspended at the moment. Everything's on online. But we hear time and time again about uh, you know skill shortages by by employers. So there's 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 still an awful lot to be done. As again, we've heard heard from Francis as well. But in terms of pure employment figures, yeah, I think things look good. And again, at the bottom of, of the pay distribution, we're pleased that the the LPC has, has helped um, you know advise on policy and get us into this position. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Right, let's 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 pause on the situation and move on to what we do about it broadly. The, um, but before we do that, one thing to say is that well, luckily one of the wonders of having multiple co-authors of these reports is that we get Hannah in person, but Nye is on Slido answering your questions uh, on there. Nye Conetti, one of the other authors, and we're also now um, uh, going to just bring up a second. The second kind of interactive thing on Slido is a guess what this chart is. This is as close as to a game show as you get with the Resolution Foundation. I don't want people's heart rates going up too far. But right, Libby, can we bring up what the chart is we are guessing this time? Uh, so if you can see properly, so you're, the numbers are running 0 to 100 on the x-axis. I'm not going to ask Sarah and Francis, panellists are not going to be traumatised by this live, don't worry. Uh, this is for people on Slido to have a guess at. And then uh, on the y-axis, on the y-axis you can see uh, running from 15 to 45. So you need something that is measured across, there's a hundred of it, and you need uh, to vote something that the answers to which come somewhere in the 25 to 35 range. For clue, I would focus on the 25 to 35 thing. What is it that comes in those kind of numbers? Uh, right, I hope that excitement wasn't too much for anybody. Uh, right, we're now gonna move on to um, discussing the situation. So I wanna uh, take this in a number of chunks, but I think there's two, Let's do a few specifics, but just to give everyone on the panel a heads up, I think the two big questions coming through on the what actually changes in this area, which we've got lots of good questions on Slido, on which we'll come to in a second, are one, um, how much is this kind of level of change, institutional innovation, uh, either possible or politically feasible? So it's like, how much is it economically labour market feasible and how much is it politically going to happen? And then the second is... Um, these changes are all nice and good, but the labour market's got very high unemployment at the moment. You, you make labour market changes at a time of high employment, not at a time of high unemployment. Right now, the priority is getting everyone back to work. In particular, that will be low uh, earners. And so don't start messing around with this stuff now. So those are the two meta challenges to this kind of conversation, which we'll, we should make sure we do. It's always good to focus on the hard questions. But I want to pick up a few specifics that people have um, have rightly based. And in this section, we're obviously talking about the prescriptions. We've set out a set of prescriptions, some of which are based on survey data and our own focus groups about what low earners want, more certainty of hours, more hours in some cases. Um, but we don't have data on all of those things. And obviously, any government actually introducing a settlement like this would want to make sure that it was consulting with low earners themselves and their employers, it should be said, about what the best version of this settlement is and we're very conscious about that writing a report from a think tank is not the same thing as doing it in government and taking a fuller range of voices uh, into account so why don't we pick up a few of the questions so uh, heather has raised a question on uh, skills which goes directly to where sarah was covering uh, just now uh, i think the team can we bring up sarah's question and if not uh, maybe me not doing my job of highlighting it sorry where is sarah so you've disappeared. Too many of you have asked questions, I can't put. But there you go, Heather, let's do Heather's question. So so, so we, we in our report um, talk, talk about the use of wage boards in problem sectors to be a key mechanism for driving up skills in those sectors as a general part of raising standards. But are there other ways we should be thinking about increasing skills uh, for the low paid? So Francis, do you wanna kick off on that one? In normal times, we'd be talking about um, individual rights uh, to train and uh, individual learning accounts and so on. I think, um, you know, this market failure has gone on so long and yet we know it's key to improving Britain's productivity and uh, people's wage packets. So I think we have to take a much more ambitious approach within the framework of recognising that we have got to have 
a jobs programme up and running, particularly for the young, quickly. And I'm hoping that we'll hear something from the Chancellor on that. Um, and we've also got to have in place industry support plans, because when furlough comes to an end, uh, there are industries uh, that will be able to bounce back. There are industries that are really strategically important to the country, but we know are going to be uh, much smaller and uh, facing trouble for years, frankly. And then others where we need new business models, upskilling, retraining, digital models, um, new ways to deliver, including in the creative industries. So we're, it's not going to be a case of one size fits all, but I think there's a really important principle at the heart of it, which is that government support, in other words, taxpayer support, should be conditional on employers and industries coming up with jobs and skills plans. And just one final point, because it's a personal frustration. I'm part of, uh, I was part of this uh, training, um, retraining partnership, national retraining partnership uh, alongside the TUC, alongside the CBI and government. It just seems crazy to me that we wasted time and didn't have available an online gateway universally available to all working people to get good basic advice and signposting to retraining and upskilling for the jobs of the future and progression at work. Why not? Yeah, turns out the internet is not ready to roll on all aspects. No. Um, right, let's take, um, there's a few questions on this. There. So it's on the Living Wage Foundation, let's take Callum's uh, question on the living wage. Um, so just a reminder for everybody, the national living wage is the minimum wage rate set for workers over 25 by the government on the recommendations of the LPC. So that's the legal requirement. The living, wa the, the living wage is a voluntary campaign that firms sign up to, the rate of which is calculated by the Resolution Foundation, out of coincidence, uh, but which is run by the Living Wage Foundation and which signs up quite a large number of employers. I think we're over 6,000 employers now. Hannah hopefully is nodding if that is vaguely right. Uh, the, um, anyway, so, so what is the role of that campaign in difficult times? Lots of people said that the living wage campaign would falter after the financial crisis. Actually, its membership went up significantly. So Sarah, what's your view on the roles of voluntary versus legal wage norms and minimums? Um, well, they obviously have two very different jobs, the, the clues in the title, the, the, the voluntary. I mean, with the national living wage and the minimum wage rates, we're talking about a, uh, a, a wage floor, a legal wage floor, which applies to everybody. Uh, the living wage campaign is about employers voluntarily signing up to it. But, but obviously, from our point of view, the more employers that sign up to it and want to pay the, the living wage rates, that, that, that's got to be a, a, a positive thing. So I, I don't see them as competing, um, you know. They, 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 they complement each other. They're only competing on the branding with the same names. But the, uh, well, but we'll blame George Osborne for that because he... Yeah, he's, he's got that. So you can blame him away. He's not a chance anymore. The, um, what is it, what's your gut feeling on whether we all see a drop-off in living wage voluntary um, sign-ups or it will be the same as it was last time when the rate stayed high? I think we'll just have to wait and see. Um, one of my fellow commissioners, I know who they are, in one of the latest meetings was saying we, we really shouldn't prejudge things. So I think we're literally just going to have to see where, where we're at in the autumn. Policy is changing so much. The economy is changing so much. We really haven't been in this sort of situation before. I mean, I, I do hope that those employers who have signed up for the living wage um, campaign will continue to do so. Um, but obviously, we also need to accept the fact or respect the fact that there's going to be, for many employers, their margins are going to be squeezed and, and, and so on. So. Fine. Very, uh, very good. Uh, Hannah, on... So social care is obviously a sector that has been put front and centre in the spotlight by this crisis for the obvious reasons about the awful uh, death rates that we've um, seen and people recognising that this also speaks to a longer term, not dealing with the challenges in the sector. What, on, the, on the living wage, do you want to touch briefly on what is the level of minimum living wage payment in the uh, social care sector? So um, living wage payment in the social care sector is really low. So I think it's more than half of frontline social care workers are not paid the real living wage. So like the amount that would be um, essential to maintaining a good standard of living. Um, but I think this is definitely one of the cases where social norms are really important. I mean, obviously, we've seen so much gratitude and recognition towards social care workers 
in particular, along with loads of others. So this this could definitely be an opportunity to um, start lifting um, pay in those sectors. Obviously, there are um, specific challenges around kind of public funding, um, but there's definitely so much room for improvement because so many social care workers are paid at or even below the, the legal minimum wage. So I think social care is hopefully a really promising sector where the real living wage can drive up standards. Great, thank you very much. Now let's let's take another question from um, Andrea from the Joseph Roundry Foundation, which is so on the which is asking broadly uh, which bits of the policy would actually benefit um, BME groups who we know are overrepresented in low paid jobs, along with a good question about their involvement in the conversation. Just to say, if we look at, I think this is the, the, there's both substance structural issues here and also data issues to do with. You know, we're just about, as Francis mentioned, seeing the data now on uh, higher mortality rates for people from BME backgrounds, but it's taken quite a long time for that to come through after people started talking about it. It's also true that most of the survey data we have about who is losing their jobs now doesn't allow us to see ethnicity breakdowns because it's not big enough surveys in general, uh, amongst other reasons. I think general people would ask the question. And um, so, Francis, what is your view? How do we? How is that issue? Are there particular areas of policy that are particularly um, uh, particularly important for BME groups. I mean, obviously, you can see it very clearly in who is low paid workers in some particular sectors, including the health sector, including social care, but not limited to those. So what's your... What's yeah, your I mean, as, as, as a package, all of these policies will disproportionately benefit black and ethnic minority workers because they are overrepresented in those um, key workers' jobs and in particular in low paid uh, key worker jobs so um, that's really important I think I think we do have to just be upfront about the fact that discrimination is part of this story too it's not an accident that workers with exactly the same qualifications or skill levels often end up in different levels of jobs with different pay attached because of the colour of their skin, so I think I think we need to be upfront about that and recognise um, that that needs tackling too. And certainly, we're hearing, you know, from our own membership about um, black workers, for example, feeling under pressure um, to work in some of the more dangerous areas, like cleaning the COVID um, wards um, or doing the unsocial night shift or um, simply taking on those jobs that we know are more exposed health and safety wise and where um, the uh, protections haven't been put in place so we've we've been involved with um, Alex Sharma and uh, the Bayes Department of Transport Education in pushing for guidelines on safety at work not just for the return but for the people who have been there throughout and making an equality impact assessment a key part of that and demanding that um, those risk assessments should be published because I think again this shouldn't be all on the shoulders of those workers alone obviously it's important that their voices are heard but it shouldn't be their sole responsibility to sort out this is a community issue because the impact of unsafe working and low pay and the health consequences of inequality harm us all so I want to see that employers are carrying out those equality impact assessments, those risk assessments, and I want to see that they're good. And the only way I can do that is if they're published. So we did secure you know, that commitment from government that they have an expectation. I would like to see that underpinned by law. Okay, great. Now, we're gonna bring up the answer uh, to the uh, quiz show style thing, assuming we can manage it, which is what is that chart showing you? Hannah did actually give you a clue to this earlier. I hope you can all see that chart there. So this is the thing we're meant to be uh, guessing. The, um, now, do we, the, there are, actually, I should, Libby, do you want to bring up, is it possible for you to bring up answers people have been coming? Because some genius may have put the answer on Slido before I reveal it. Here we go. Right, what answers have we got? Ooh, how many of the lowest paid off full-time students? It's easy. Someone's actually read the report, have they? <laughs> Yes, it's even got an exclamation mark in it. It must be true. All right, okay. So that is basically the answer. If you flip back, uh, the, um, uh, I'll show you the proper version of the uh, chart. The, um, but whoever read the report, you are a winner. The, um, nobody ever actually reads 
the reports, Hannah, apart from your ones, which they obviously read every single one of. Um, uh, so this is what the chart is actually showing you, which is basically making the point that if you went back 100 years, it was the lower paid men in society who worked the longest hours in society. But over the course of the, lot of the 20th century, we've moved to a situation where it is consistently the lower hourly paid people that work the shortest hours. So hours, as well as the actual lower pay, are an important part of why we're getting. And, and now this is to do with shorter hours, if they are part-time or full-time, but it's just also we've seen a move towards part-time work for lower paid men. Lower paid men all used to work full-time, to keep it simple, and have moved into sectors that tended to be female dominated, particularly younger men, uh, while women in general have been increasing their hours, particularly in the last decade, um, but are still much more likely to work part-time, which is why you see uh, lower, uh, lower hours across the entire hourly pay distribution uh, for women. Now, I want to wrap us up then on the hard question. So can we just, Libby, can we just bring up Joe's question from, uh, from Slido? Let's take these two together, basically, which is, is any of this politically feasible, actually doable? What are the trade and what are the trade-offs? And in particular, can we touch on, is any of this a good idea when we've got high unemployment levels? So Sarah, that's the hard bit. Why don't you kick us off, Sarah, on unfairly on the difficult question? Okay, so I have to unmute. Um, well, I think this is where uh, the LPC's emergency break comes into play. I mean, I see it as a, an enabling instrument to help us reach the, the target, the new target that's been set for us. So in terms of whether it's politically fe feasible, as I said, the in terms of the target of the NLW, we're quite clear that, that that's, that's a, a political decision. But if we think back to the financial crisis in 2008, um, in 2008 and 2009, uh, the LPC made, made recommendations to slow down the growth of the NLW. And our research suggests that um, we didn't, the, these upgradings didn't damage employment. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that's gonna happen um, this October because we're not there yet. Um, and, and so many things are changing. But in terms of our perspective, the fact that we have an emergency break is something that we can use to help us guide us to this target. Um, and as I said in, in, in my little sort of brief, brief talk, um, regardless of the situation we're in now, two thirds of median earnings is an ambitious target anyway. So I think having this flexibility is going to be really important in, in achieving um, the pay side of, of, of the settlement. Um, and in terms of the other points that um, the other recommendations which we made in 2018, and again, you, you reiterated today, we're, we're, we're pleased you've done that because it, it keeps the things on the agenda. So Great. thank you. Hannah, how should we think about this? Your last word, but how, how should we think about timing of this? Why are you writing a low pay paper about changing things when unemployment is going through the roof? Yeah, I mean, I think as Sarah said, it's obviously like important to keep an eye on what's going on in the wider economy. But I don't think that means that we shouldn't aim um, aim high, basically. I mean, partly just because there, there is now more than ever a will to um, support low paid workers. But also we need to remember that even in when times were good, there was still even when we were at full employment, we'd only kind of we'd still had a lot of um, insecurity in the labour market we still had pay that was only just reaching its its peak so it's not it's not something that we had right even when we had full employment so I think it's really important and now is kind of a time when we're thinking about what our economy is going to look like a time of massive change and I think it's right that we're thinking about how we want the future to look. That's great and obviously we can plan for what the future should look like even if the implementation takes into account the state of the labour market in those years as they roll out. Francis, I'm guessing you would like to carry on changing things, uh, but give us your answer give us, and then wrap up, you can wrap up the event as well. <laughs> I think there's a really good sensible case to make for um, investment for growth um, and higher wages at a time when interest rates are so low that this is our, our chance, if you like, to reset the economy and rebuild on decently paid, skilled work. Um, that's, you know, we've seen it's been uh, key workers who have got us through this crisis. And I think we've got to work our way out of uh, recession, but with decently paid jobs in the parts of the country that need them most. But I also think there's a real political dilemma for the prime minister. Um, you know, clearly his chancellor never expected to be in the position of nationalising a, a third of the country's payroll or 
to be advocating the sorts of big state initiatives that we're seeing in terms of investment in infrastructure and um, promises of continued support uh, for strategically important sectors. That has gone down like a lump of lead uh, on the hard right libertarians who um, would like to get back to business as usual, the old normality of um, cuts and deregulation and as the best way, you know, creative destruction uh, to get Britain uh, ruling the waves again. Uh, but he's also got to think about his red wall seats. And I can tell you, because we represent many people in them, that um, the idea that their jobs would uh, be allowed to go to uh, the wall or that they should put up with more zero hours and more cheap labor and exploitation of their adult children is not gonna be popular. So he's got a political dilemma with Brexit looming, uh, really difficult, uh, prolonged times ahead where it will take time before we even get a vaccine. So, you know, these measures are gonna be, have to be in place for some time. This is his opportunity, if you like. And I think it's our opportunity to see a shift in that center of gravity to build a new consensus around uh, decency and dignity at work. Okay, well, let's end on decency and dignity and work because I think most people are in favour of that, I'm assuming, uh, around the world. It's always good to end on a point of consensus. If you're not in favour of decency and dignity at work, you're on the wrong think tank's webinar. Uh, that, that's kind of our thing. Right, look, I want to say thank you to our uh, panel for uh, joining us. I'm sorry I didn't get the memo about wearing a red top uh, for work about the labour market, but next time, Hannah and I will be on message. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you at home for uh, joining us for an hour and giving us your time and giving us your questions and your votes on spuriously enjoyable quizzes. Um, we'll have another event next week on a launch of a book by Martin Sambu on the economics of belonging, uh, which is hopefully full of similar ideas uh, to the ones you've heard today, but he's looked, taking a slightly broader cross-national perspective uh, and Lisa Nandy is joining us to comment on that. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. If you'd like to... Um, if you'd like to vote on a, give us feedback on these events, there is actually a post-event survey and we're very grateful for your thoughts on that. So have a good day.